Going live, by the way. Sorry, I'm oh, just okay. going live. We're live now, okay? All right. Everybody straighten your tie. Oh, no, it's whatever. Uh, chat amongst yourselves. Uh, it's All the right. after show. So, so go ahead, so, Ozzy. Ozzy you, 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 were telling, you were saying about how, how you get invited to all these uh, discourses. Well, yeah, you were saying I, I seem to be uh, uh, Living. putting a lot of videos. Yeah, putting Living. a lot of videos where uh, I'm in. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I, I'm fortunate. I, I have I have the time, but um, no, I just of late I have gotten a lot of invitations to be participate in hangouts and shows and stuff like that, and. Um, and hangouts tend to go on for a long time, so you, it's very easy when you do a, a, a few hangouts to, to sort of rack up a lot of hours. Um, yeah, well, I noticed that they, you seem to rack up almost as many hours as there are in a day. <laughs> uh, no, that's not true, uh, but I'm retired, right? Um, yeah, I, I know. I remember you told so, me that. So, yeah. so I, I have more time than most uh, to do these things, and, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's the shoulder season. I, I, I like to do a lot of uh, camping and stuff like that, and... Um, the weather is such that it's uh, it's not uh, conducive to go canoe camping right now. Uh, the water's starting to get a little bit crispy, if you know yeah. what I mean. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's hard to go canoe camping right now, or, or any any such thing. So spending a lot well, more time I just indoors. Want to point out, I just want to point out the one difference between myself and everybody else who had, who's been on this show usually, I think, is that I've never put out a video. Well, what's stopping you? I, I've been having uh, a great I, I was, time. I was, I, I, actually, you know what? You know what? Um, it was DPR who who sort of got me, uh, DPR and um, Thunderfoot who got me to bring get up my nerve to start just talking about this stuff. I never talked to them before, but um, just some of their videos that I've seen or I'd seen, yeah, I've been following them for a long, long time, and I just figured, you know, I have to come in and comment. I mean, after all, I do live in Israel. Um, <laughs> I have lived in the United States and I have lived in Europe, so I have some things to say about uh, societies and history and different places uh, where where it comes to religion and politics. So I just that's but I never actually have released any of like a video like that. No, I think I released should. one video. It was like a game video about Minecraft. It was like two years ago. You know that was basically my video contribution to YouTube. Um, it's got like maybe 30 views, um, so uh, yeah, I've, I've never done it. But uh, you guys are kind of making me think that I should start. I don't know. We'll see. Well, I mean, it, it, it's fun. I, I mean, I for years I had friends. I was in, sort of involved online in IRC chats and forums uh, discussing these issues, uh, but I, I never wanted to sort of venture into making uh, YouTube videos on on these questions. Um, and I, I mean, I have another channel that's a how-to channel that has nothing to do with these things, and I, I'm not camera shy or anything like that, obviously. Um, so I had no problem uh, making YouTube videos, but I, I just never felt like uh, I wanted to sort of inject myself into this conversation. There's so many pe people in it already who were making good stuff. Uh, but then, um, sort of weird circumstances arose. I thought I'd give it a give it a shot. It started just with doing hangouts, um, and and appearing here on the Magic Sandwich Show. And I just thought, you know, I got to start making videos because I've got friends telling me I should, you know, give it a shot. And then I got a couple of encouraging messages from uh, from people who watch the Magic Sandwich Show. So I started doing it, and it's been great fun. I'm I'm really loving doing it. I just got this mountain of things that I want to. Do in videos, so I mean, you, I mean, living in Israel and stuff like that, you're going to have a very different perspective on these things. Um, I, I would encourage you to enter the discussion. Uh, I mean, you know, you're, you're either going to like it or not, and if you like it, great, and if you don't, you don't. I mean, well, I used to write a blog, and it used to have. This was several years ago, like I said, I told you once. Uh, it used to have a lot of followers. Um, people used to read it regularly. Um, and I was number one in Google for certain searches, etc. Not by design, just because a lot of people were pointing to my blog. Um, so I really enjoyed writing, but I've just never done a video of myself before. I don't know if I if I can, but maybe maybe we'll see. It's just more fun talking to you guys. But you don't have to appear in a video, right? I mean, a lot of people just <clears throat> excuse me. They do voiceover and animation and illustration. I mean, I don't have any of the, the technical expertise for that. So my bore, my videos are really like, they're they're boring. It's just me talking either to the camera or people 
talking with people, you know. But even so, I mean, the, the no, I think I think you're awesome. interesting, but that is because you're an interesting philosopher. <laughs> well, well, I wouldn't call myself a philosopher. I mean, I, I'm someone with a, a, a philosophical education, but I'm not a, I mean, I'm yeah, not a practicing I, philosopher. Well, no, but I, I, I hasten to, to 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 clarify that because I've had people uh, sort of assume that I'm a philosopher, and I don't want anyone to sort of uh, walk away with. Uh, with mis misapprehensions about uh, what my actual credentials are or titles or anything like that. I mean, and I don't think anything hinges on on that kind of thing. I mean, the, these are these are all questions that we can talk about. I mean, it helps if one has some training in these things. You can not get stumped by Saiten Bruggenkate, for instance. Uh, yeah. But uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm trust. Well, I, I would. I would. Yeah. Yeah. If I may yeah. jump in here briefly, I can assure you that after seven, eight, maybe nine hours of talking to Ozzy, he does actually get boring in the end. Okay. Well, I've spoken to him for three, I think, our first conversation was for three hours or something like that. He's not boring. You, He's not you go boring. away lightly. Yeah, yeah, I know. No, I, of course I, you know. It was, it was like 2 a.m. when I finished. So, if uh, I have a lot of blab in me, it's true. Uh, yeah. If for, a mo if for a moment I thought he believed that. But he is a backstabber. Don't trust him at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I still have my. I, I was w looking for a knife the other day, and I realized I left it in Jason Burns' back. It's, uh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other, the other idiot. You know, I, 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 you know, you know what? I, I just sorry. I, I wasn't. I wasn't going to mention him. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. One moment. Oh no! Here comes. Obviously, I alluded to him during the course of the show, but I wasn't going to mention him. But I was so desperate to point out that he had made a 22-part series today. <laughs> are you kidding? No. 22-part series. Nope. Not at well, all. Well, some of them are 30 seconds long. Series about, yeah, I, 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 I did a sort of like quick mental summary. I think um, they average out at about one minute each. So he could have put it all into a 20-minute video. But it was but all about the... Evidence for the uh, resurrection of Jesus. Well, he's he clearly is so insane. so obsessed with that. But he's clearly I, insane. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I he's not think insane. He probably. Well, I, I don't. I, no, he's not insane. He's he's got issues. Um, and I know that I've had discussions with Ozzy and Hogtai, um, not necessarily at the same time, about what that condition may be. Um, I I don't feel comfortable or comfortable them to really sort of like put my money on the table, so to speak, when it comes to what that condition may be. But it, it, it quite it involves um, an element of delusion um, and an element of an inability to, to appreciate just how thick you are. Well, d does he have many people uh, who I mean, follow him? It, 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 uh, I, I think I think I'm probably his greatest fan. Uh, yeah, Ozzy maybe the second greatest fan. Hogtie yeah, maybe I, I love his shows. I, I, I'm obs I am obsessed with him, and I I, I can uh, I totally uh, admit that. Um, every single uh, time I turn on my computer, I want to see whether um, Jason has made another video, and I notice that during the course of uh, our program, he's posted one, which. Um, Atheist shot down by suppositional apologetics by Jason Burns, which is odd because <laughs> in the last two days he's been calling himself the Reverend uh, Jason Burns uh, and been wearing a dog collar. Um, he's, he, he's stopped doing that now. Um, Did you see the one where he was swearing? No, he didn't. There was some of where he called himself the Re, R E. He missed off the V, but he did it in two parts. Oh, I mean, honestly. We had a conversation a couple of weeks ago about why I'm obsessed with Jason Burns, and it's because you never know what the fuck he's going to come up with next. Uh, he's Howard Stern. Stern. Became yeah, I was, I was about to say he's like a shock jock. But, he's like a shock jock, like Howard Stern. He almost he was, did you see him swearing? In a way I'm that, not though, familiar with Howard Stern, but yeah, I don't believe wouldn't be, but, uh, I, I want the evidence. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's so what you're saying is it's like a rubbernecking sort of thing. You know, people who, who yes. are, 
slowing down to watch the, the to look at the car crashes or basically yeah. watching for the the train to to derail. It's uh, yeah, it's that sort of thing. I, it's I like understand. You, 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 you're on the opposition team, to, though, DPR. He needs to come up with new strategies. He needs to come up with new strategies to, you know, beat the opposition. And he, he comes until, up with them and, all the time. I know, and it does, but it, and it doesn't matter how many he of them. He comes you, up with them all know, the time. You're a few, uh, yeah, I know. Come on. And, and you, just, you, can, you, you cannot just, tell me. Whoa, 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 it's like a Liverpool whoa. fan. It's like a Liverpool me. fan defending his team. You know, it's they're only as good as the last game they played. You know, you cannot tell me. You cannot tell me that you foresaw the fact that he would argue that he had retired entirely from YouTube and then reappeared on the basis that he was no longer Jason Burns, he was the Reverend <laughs> Jason Burns. So this is not him returning, no, no, no. this was a resurrection. Yes, I was about to say the resurrection. I'm not suggesting that I'm, I know his strategies are going to be or his next move is going to be, but yeah, no, I, of course not, no. No, no. What was predictable was that he would return; that he could not possibly stay away from uh, from YouTube yeah, yeah. And, and making videos, inveighing against uh, against atheists and atheism. Um, yeah. But but the manner in which he does it, the, and and the pretext that he gives himself for why he returns uh, when he when he bothers to do so. Sometimes he just sort of slides back into it slowly, or not so slowly. But um, but this one was 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 truly amusing to see him in the, in, in in the collar and uh, titling himself Reverend. <laughs> Um, I mean, I have no idea what the rules are about uh, wearing these things and, and such titles and whether or not he is, in fact, entitled to call himself that. He might be. I don't know. Uh, but it was certainly very amusing. Uh, but what was funny was I've, I've, in one of his recent videos, he's swearing. He's him. saying, Ozzie, God damn, one second, God damn. One second, Ozzy. Ozzy, 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 one second. I've asked him this question, um, and I've also used from his previous videos in which he was did, what was it, a 12-part or 10-part series supporting site and root and cake. And he said, if people don't answer the question, then you're perfectly entitled to ask it, ask it, uh, sorry, ask it again. So I sent him every eight hours or so, Jason, when and how did you become a reverend? And he has refused to respond apart from sending me, this is through Skype, apart from sending me a dancing man in response. He won't answer. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to keep on asking him. Uh, well, you, 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 have you seen DPR? Have you seen the video where he's he's swearing, where he completely loses his cool? He was he was in a hangout uh, uh, with uh, John F. McDropout, mm. who's 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 bent over backwards trying mm. to be very conciliatory and nice, and 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 sort of uh, this was after Jason Burns had declared that he was retiring from YouTube. It was kind of a a, a going away party, you know, a, a hangout with a bunch of atheists. It was all very yeah. very convivial and, and friendly and, and, and nice and the first one went well and the second one completely went south um, and, uh, and <laughs> yeah I have some theories about why but but the next day Jason just made this the, 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 a pair of videos where he went on just a, a screed and where he was in sort of like you know Hitler mode you know oh, you know do karate chopping you know <laughs> we must and this you know oh, and, yeah. and I was in stitches, we watching it. And of course, worse, you know, worse, worse than the KGB and all that sort of thing. But what's what's even yeah. more odder uh, than that is the fact that he actually, as he always does, whenever he makes a public appearance, he always has to make a series of videos about analysing his previous appearance on this show and whatever. Right. And he did that. It, it, he did, I think, eight videos about his appearance. Um, something about, oh, in fact, I've got his channel here, hang on, I can tell you exactly. It was um, Conversation with Atheists, or something like that. Because when your team um, loses, you try oh, and you exactly. justify what the strategies were at the time. So he has to justify, well, oh, yeah. we went with that play because we felt it was the right play at the time, but unfortunately, um, yeah. it got to but he, he did, moving He on. did a uh, five-part series called A Dialogue with Atheists, in which he complained in a sort of reasonable manner about how he didn't like being on the show, even though he stayed on the show for the best part of two hours. But on, this, is, this is the thing, uh, Ozzy. It was the same day, that uh, it was a few hours later, but it was the same day that he went into um, his, his rant um, where angels fear to tread 
where he completely lost the plot and basically made the, so, the same arguments but with much more emotion and much more foul language and includes it, including, I have to say, I think for the first time um, using the, uh, his, his, his God's name in vain. Yeah, yeah God damn, God damn it. Yeah. yeah, God damn it, that really, that surprised me. Yeah, that surprised me too. Uh, there was a Christian in the comments who's, who's, who's sort of reached out to him a number of times um, and who who's sort of, you know, upbraided him very, very gently for that. Um, and uh, that that video, by the way, was was all the part two of that. Where angels fear to tread is is the one where he he uh, he, he gets you know dewy eyed about how how he loved me like a brother. We we had three Skype voice chats, uh, not long ones either. Um, and and one of them was after I told him, listen, I think we shouldn't have contact. And I I skyped him to say, you know, uh, there's a video I'd like to of yours that I'd like to edit and mirror on my channel, which he graciously graciously agreed to, by the way. Um, and so really, we only had two voice Skype chats, both initiated by me, and about three, four, five—I'm not sure exactly how many—typed uh, Skype chats uh, over several months. Again, all initiated by me, and and yet he says, you know, I, we were great friends, and he loved me like a brother, and you know, I, I don't know how he's sort of blown this up in, in into you know this man crush that we had on each other, but. <laughs> You know. Well, I think, anyway, I think that just shows how. There are, there, are, there are two. There are two points. There are two points that I wanted to comment on um, in relation to that. Uh, and Jason, I um, I know that you'll be watching either live or you'll you'll watch it later. Um, the first is that I, I think that it displays, um, and, and I, I say this with great sympathy, genuine sympathy. It it displays just how. Um, lonely uh, and isolated uh, Jason is um, that he thinks that uh, a brief um, Skype connection with someone uh, implies friendship. Uh, I think that's very sad. I think that he, he obviously is someone that leads a very, very isolated life and, and is someone that really does not have any true friends. So I, I'm, I'm sympathetic in that regard. Um, the second point is, though, that uh, I have to make it clear to you, Jason. Ozzy did not stab you in the back. The conversations that I had with Ozzy, he did not disclose at all anything that you were going to raise in our debate, discussion, whatever, on your paper, footnote, lecture notes, or whatever. He didn't disclose anything. The closest it came is that I asked Ozzy, do you think if I asked Jason whether he thought the Bible was inerrant, he would say yes or no? And Ozzy said, I know what he would say, but I'm not going to tell you. That is the only thing that we ever discussed but, you about know, are... your or our debate. Yeah, facts are irrelevant, though, and it's it's more important about his narrative about you know the atheists or these conniving, deceiving people, and and uh, I find it's interesting the interplay between the, the the very typical Christian narrative of how we're all victims and persecuted and so forth, and also in in Jason's sort of unrelated to theology, his particular lot in life that he doesn't seem to really make friends all that well. And then he kind of justifies it by the sour grapes. So I didn't want to be friends with that that person anyway. Um, but he kind of weaves the two together into this thing where he'll actually turn his back on circumstances where where friendship and companionship is legitimately offered. I mean, um, you know, I stabbed him in the back, Ozzy stabbed him in the back. Uh, the, the big blow up in, in leading up to uh, when Angels Fear to Tread was was uh, was John F. McDropout, uh, another Canadian. Maybe it's, maybe it's the Canadians. Yeah, yes. Canadian. Can, it's not the atheist conspiracy. It's <laughs> it's the nice guy. John apparently is a really nice fellow. I actually don't know him either. Well, what is this? Where angels like, fear to tread thing? I I don't know anything about this. Well, well actually, let me yeah. summarize real quick. I mean, he, he had a uh, he was Friday evening. This is the second time he's done uh, what I've been calling the Left Coast Show. I don't know if that's the proper name for it, but uh, um, John I believe is the host of it. But they it, it's very very friendly, very nice. It's a bridge building sort of thing. 
and it was the second week in a row that, that um, Jason was on there, and I think he, he enjoyed himself. He had a really good laugh. There were some sort of off-color comments and something about doing a lot of drinking, and he, he seemed to really enjoy himself and had commented a number of times about how it's really nice because there are some bad guys. You know, once again, he has to take another slap at DPR Jones and what a jerk he is, and these guys all try to gang up on you, but you guys are so nice, and I really enjoy this. Love to do it week after week. Well, then by, by the next morning, he produces uh, videos where he is sort of reflecting on what this experience was like, and he start, it turns a little sour for him. He starts saying, well, they just wanted to pick on Saiten Bruken Gate, as he calls them, and, um, and, and just increasingly over this, I believe it was a five-part series, starts to sort of get more upset with how these atheists sort of conduct themselves poorly. And then after perhaps a break, of an hour, I'm not sure how long the break was, he then made these two videos where Angels Fear to Tread, where he was extremely upset with these guys, and in particular this John, and actually referred to how John, you know, the hand of friendship was there and he stabbed him in the back. So where Angels Fear to Tread is, is the two-part thing that comes after the five-part thing. Initially he was happy, and then he had some concerns, and then there was this where Angels Fear to Tread, where he's enraged about it to the point where he's shouting, God damn it, change! God damn it, change, DPR! God damn it, change, Aussie! And and he just has this complete meltdown. And and what's interesting about it, and we all know people that sort of take a set of circumstances or facts and kind of exaggerate them or turn them or view them in a bit of a weird perspective. But often with with Jason's sort of fantasy of persecution, it, it's not linked to anything. There's 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 nothing in like in, in, you know. DPR has explained a number of times that you know, whatever, like Jason can kind of have a fantasy about whatever conversations happen uh, between Ozzy and, and DPR, um, and it, it's simply not based on, on any fact, um, but, but his fact, fantasy will prevail. In the case of, of John, John has been absolutely nice to him and done nothing to, to sort of hurt his feelings in any sense, but over a period of time it just turns into how John is... Uh, I mean, he had some justification because because Alex Botton had called into the show and John had let him on, and, and that somehow is proof that John is actually an evil backstabber and whatnot. So Rangel's fear to trade was that sort of shouting. Swear uh, it it sounds. I mean, I, I I'm not a physician, but it sounds to me like a perfect mix of of paranoid. Uh, delusion uh, coupled with like something uh, like Tourette syndrome <laughs> is what we're talking about. Um, I, I don't know Jason Byrne as I've never spoken to him. I've never had any interaction with him, but I've seen, I've only seen a couple of his videos, and you know, I've seen the one where he's like, "You dirty, 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 DPR shows you dirty, dirty," and 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 that was like the extent of. Um, his argument <laughs> and his video. Uh, so yeah, he doesn't seem to be um, quite all there. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you what I, I what I I'll tell you what I see uh, um, with Jason, and I, I I'm I'm going to invite people not to sort of like go on about it too much more um, because he's not here to defend himself. Um, but what I what I do see is a similarity with a lot of theists. Um, in that, uh, I, and I'm talking about YouTube theists, um, this total lack of trust uh, in people. Uh, I see it with um, Nephilim Free, I saw it with Vernon Fang X, and I see it with Jason. Um, this ability to form normal relationships seems to be something that is, is, is a problem with all of them. but. As I say, um, it, it, it's it's perhaps unfair uh, to go on too much about someone. No, even I don't see why it is. No, he, he, yeah, but he wants to be talked well, about. That's I, I'll tell you point. what. I'll tell you what might be more interesting. Yeah. Well, can I tell you what might be more interesting? Someone who has sent a um, Skype message to me. Uh, they don't have a, a camera or a microphone, so they can't join us. But they ask this question. About presuppositionalism, <laughs> looking oh, at it, no. I'm getting a cat's tail flicking in my face. Um, I was wondering if you could ask if the time seems to come up again in this conversation. Isn't the fact that the presuppositional apologetic is asking you questions 
to try to stump you mean that they that he has already taken assumption taken as assumptions the very things he is asking you to prove put it another way couldn't you just respond to prees up um, open quotation marks just answer your own question would assume what you want to prove just answering your own question would assume what you want to prove well, I, 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 under I understood part of that question, but as Ozzy is the expert in presuppositional apologetics, by all means, go ahead, Ozzy. Uh, well, I'm not an expert in presuppositional apologetics, but I think I understand it. I've, I've done considerable reading on it and talking. No, I, I to, meant to, to in, in, our, in our group oh, here. Oh, right okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Well, again, I just don't want there to be misunderstandings. If, no, if no, I, no. You know, done a PhD in presuppositional apologetics or something. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, uh, Pre presuppositionalists uh, assume that they've got the truth in their back pocket and they think they've got the answers to these uh, stumper questions. They think they have an account of knowledge that they can account for logic, that they can account for morality, etc., etc. And they think you, you can't. Um, and so the, the strategy of, of what are called the cyclones, Saiten Bruggenkate and his disciples, the cyclones, is to simply uh, assault you with questions and, and normally you know, when, you, when you ask somebody a question you let them go for a bit. You let them answer, and uh, you know they'll sta state a few premises. And you you know you don't necessarily interrupt them at every juncture. You let them go to see if, in the course of their explanation, any assumptions that they have made that can be discharged in the course of the argument. Uh, by discharge, I mean show that the the, the assumptions are vindicated. Uh, and they don't do that. They just keep interrupting you, and keep interrupting you, and keep interrupting you. And if you even try and turn around and say, "Well, wait a minute," you know, how do you answer these questions or anything of the sort? Uh, they'll say, well, no, unless you can, uh, you know, uh, you know, tell me what your standard of truth is and, and defend the use of reason, I don't have to listen to you. Now, this is not what any proper presuppositionalist would do. This is what the cyclones do. This is, I mean, I have a whole video about about sort of disentangling what presuppositionalism asserts. I and watched what, it. It's very good. Lunk, thank you. Uh, what these, these lunk-headed uh, presuppositionalists, presuppositionalists are doing when they try to stump you. That's, that is not proper presuppositionalism. I don't have a lot of respect for presuppositionalism, but the argument is not completely bananas. But what these people are doing is simply trying to interrupt you and stump you. So if you try to turn the tables on them and interrupt them uh, right back, uh, they, they simply won't do it. They won't stand for it. They, they're, they're, they are not about having a conversation. They're there to try to interrogate you and show up your ignorance. And they think that by displaying this, they can show the paucity of your worldview and and by implication the superiority of their own worldview and their sophistication and and philosophical erudition to anyone else who happens to be standing by and looking uh, and uh, and that's what happens people look and go oh this guy seems to know something about philosophy you know um, well you know those of us who are in a better position to know can see right through that like a laser but the average person isn't necessarily going to know that and they they play to that they play to audiences Saiten Bruggenkate is he goes to college campuses and on the street he stumps people rudely with these questions gets it all on film packages it at, uh, packages it together as a video called something like um, I don't know how to deal with the fool or some damn thing like that um, and and this gets shown in church basements as how to deal with atheists I mean it's, it's just unconscionable. It's just such a shame he's not visiting here. I would, I would, I would answer his question, but not in the way that he'd want it. I'd have to record it myself and release it as a video online. I, it's just such a bloody shame he's not going to come here. And uh, I would go and I would go and uh, stump him, or you know, more to the point. I mean, this him, but, this you know. this actually draws up a parallel, I think, with the likes of Ray Comfort who go around the streets uh, interviewing people about um, evolution and they ask them questions or you know what was the first thing that came out to the sea uh, could it did it have lungs or whatever and these people with absolutely no idea about evolution so sort of like oh I don't know and he cleverly edits this uh, into um, Money making DVDs. Yeah. I'd love to see <clears throat> Ray Comfort uh, bump into Don Exodus or Aaron or Concordance or Thunderfoot and ask them. You'll never see that. 
I bet it, I, I bet that such a situation has happened. Oh, I'm sure it happens. That yeah. he has Surely. actually answered, uh, asked someone who knows the truth. But you'll never see that. Well, um, what's her name? Jacqueline. This, Jacqueline. This, this is what I'm, the point I'm making. Sorry, just to, to, to finish very briefly. This is the point I'm making. It is utter disingenuous dishonesty these people are doing in order to for their apparently mo moral message. Well, uh, I don't know if you saw uh, this girl who does um, uh, really funny videos called Jacqueline Glenn, I think is her name. She did a, a video debunking uh, Ray Comfort's, uh, you know, latest "quote unquote" movie, and uh, Richard Dawkins, you know, retweeted her and and got to she got to meet him, etc. Anyway, um, she demanded quite publicly that he release all the unedited footage, uh, and he he's refused because he said oh, it doesn't change anything in the the final uh, video. It doesn't you know it doesn't show anybody explaining evolution. Uh, to anybody's satisfaction, etc. But she kept demanding and pressing him on it. He got really kind of. Uh, he started, you know, trying to rebut her, and then just sort of let it drop because he saw that he, he couldn't. He couldn't uh, release that video because obviously, obviously, the unedited footage will show some people who explained it perfectly well, uh, including obviously P.Z. Myers, etc whom I have plenty of disagreements with, but he does know about evolution. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah, he just sort of let that topic drop uh, after a while, I think, uh, because he, you know, he won't do it. I had a question. Uh, it, it's it, no, no. Uh, not directly related to this, Go if on. I may. Oh, it, it's, a, it's a question for Hogtie. There was a, there was a, a hangout yesterday. Uh, Fundamentally Flawed had, a, had their... Uh, their podcast show yesterday, and then there was an after show hangout. Uh, and Hawkeye seemed to, to to be keen to get uh, get into the after show. Um, and I, w I was wondering, uh, was there some burning question you wanted to answer, or something like that? Or oh, I'm trying to remember how that went. Uh, it, it was uh, I had been thinking yesterday about the the reason rock, and then it was funny ah, uh, right. that at the same time um, Jason had put up a video about. You know how evolution can't explain. Oh no, that, well, that's part of what it was. Because when, when he had his little six-minute meltdown on on uh, fundamentally flawed, uh, that's essentially what it was about. It was like you guys explain to me how evolution explains rationality. Right. And and there may or may not be an explanation from evolutionary theory. I mean, the thing is, sometimes I know when, when questions like that would 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 put to me in, in Shock to God's chat room or in some of these other, other hangouts and chats, um, I will often take the position, I'll say, well, look, I may have an explanation for that now. I may be able to, you know, let's stand in front of a whiteboard and I'll give you an hour-long lecture on what, how I think something like love or charitability or rationality or whatever has come from evolution. I could give you that. But, but let, let's dial it back. Let's say you asked me that question when I was 16 years old. My answer would be, I don't know. That doesn't mean that there doesn't... Um, exist an explanation from somebody who does know what they're talking about. Um, so you go ahead and make your point. I generally kind of just yield on that and say, let's just pretend I don't have an explanation for those things. Um, but yeah, my, my eagerness about it was because I, I had been thinking of this reason, Rob, that basically you could just insert anything as your claim for the genesis of rationality or love or whatever else, or mathematics, logic, whatever. And um, uh, and then I did happen to find, which actually I believe is, uh, um, I think it's actually concrete. I think it's a broken up piece of concrete. And so well, there, there's there's the reason rock. So that well, I'll call in and, and answer uh, Jay's question for him. But then he had the the swearing meltdown, and um, and then he hung up. I thought he was kicked, but I guess he hung up. But yeah, that was that was me. I, I was going to introduce the reason rock on uh, on fundamentally flawed if, if given a chance last night. I'm sorry, I missed that. Well, you didn't because you were here for it today. Although oh, that's true. No, no, but I would have liked to have seen it, <laughs> seen it then, and, and to, to see his reaction. Although I, I'm, I'm confident he would now have, have made scores of videos, uh, laughing about how you were con comparing a rock to his god. Well, that, honestly, you know, and I had anticipated too that like it's something that, uh, because the thing is, reason rock is yet another link in the chain of uh, Russell's teapot and the dragon in the garage and this flying spaghetti monster. Mind you, each of those things have been have been brought forward as uh, reductio ad absurdum 
uh, counter arguments um, for separate reasons. So I know, for example, that people will criticize, well, the flying spaghetti monster doesn't explain everything. This fly flying spaghetti monster would actually have to take up some space and his noodly appendage would be a physical thing. I don't know how Christians would conclude that the noodly appendage would be a physical thing. It could be a supernatural noodly appendage. I don't get that. But they're clearly missing the point. I mean, that to really get the flying spaghetti I, monster, I, a person has to be familiar with the history of why FSM was was created in direct and specific response to, to the uh, situation in uh, Dover, Pennsylvania. I, I, I think that um Everyone here is misunderstanding Jason's question, which I'm going to try as best I can to reformulate, uh, so to speak. Um, what, uh, and this goes back to what I said in the, the, the first part of this show. What he's asking is effectively how does reason come from non material elements? The atoms. Yeah, and, and I think he's confounding but two. He, he, he may he may as well he may as well ask um, how does life uh, what the the basis of abiogenesis or the um, origins of consciousness. He may as well ask that question. It all boils down to the same thing. So as far as I understand his question to be, namely, you know, how do you get? Um, living material from non-living material. That, I think, really is the essence of, of the question that he was asking. And I do think that fundamentally flawed um, didn't avoid the question. They didn't understand it in the terms that he was expressing. But I think that was the question that he was actually asking. Yeah, well, that, that, you know, actually, it, just in direct comment to the issue about, about whether there was a misunderstanding on, on fundamentally flawed, you know, the, the fact, uh, and, I, and I saw Jay's response to this and just makes me roll my eyes. Um, um, he was, he was, his question had to do with sort of where does reason come from? And he was asked, how are you using the word reason? In what sense? We don't want to answer this question for you using reason in a different sense than you're using it. We don't want to make that equivocation fallacy. So you tell us how you're using the word reason. What, what, what is the thing X that you're trying, you're seeking to find our explanation for? And his response was to say, well, what does it say in the dictionary? And, and of course, it doesn't matter what it says in the dictionary. It doesn't matter what it says in Alex. I may have an impression of what I thought he meant by reason, but, but you clarify your question for us. And the guy just went just insane about how, well, you tell us what reason is. So he's not, as he's admitted himself, he's not good at thinking on his feet. He couldn't simply say, oh, okay, well, for the purposes of my question, what I'm seeking an explanation for is reason in the sense of this and this and this. He can't do that. He's got to be, oh, what does a dictionary say? Whatever. And then, of course, I've seen, you know, he made a response along the lines of how well, they were avoiding the question and, like, how Alex didn't even know what reason meant. Well, how can these people claim to be, you know, experts in, in any sort of area of philosophy if they don't know what reason means, and completely missing the point. They weren't asking, well, we've never re reason. What, am I pronouncing that correctly? We don't. We've never heard this word. We're saying, look, okay, explain your damn question. What do you mean by reason? So I don't think they were avoiding the question. Yeah, well, I, 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 I agree. I mean, what his question was. Yeah, um, I, I, and I've extracted as best I can what his question meant, uh, and I think there's a very simple answer to it, um, and it comes um, through. Um, evolution. Uh, uh, any entity that can have a conscious, consciousness is likely to be better suited to survival. Um, and any entity that can reason, likewise, is going to have a better chance of survival. I think there's a perfectly easy um, answer to that question. Although but, I think that misses um, out on... Unfortunately, they, they didn't... Sorry, do go on. Oh, I, I think that misses out on on the the question presupposes something about the nature of reason um, that, that's kind of hard to put in the language. Like they believe that reason and logic and math and love are these things that sort of float around the ether, and they're something that that is not tied to to um, uh, material in any way. And they're asking for an explanation of sort of how we, we, you know, we come to like, like where do those things come from? The, the question that I think you're answering, and, and in Thunderfoot's recent video, I think answers very well, 
answers the question of how the material that makes up our bodies has come to um, develop the capacity to perform the calculus of reason. Right, so I mean, we can use an evolutionary account to say things like I had mentioned earlier in discussing the reason rock about how planaria are able to sort of detect light and turn in one direction in response to it, or like brine shrimp are able to um, detect the salinity and to find exactly the right amount of salinity. They'll move away from slightly hypotonic salinity to you know to the right region, and then of course as you get you know further and further, well you know sharks for example. Um, having good sharp teeth and the ability to replace the teeth when lost would give an advantage. And then having brains that are able to process, hey, when, when these uh, blood sensors fire in the in, in the olfactory system, uh, such as it is for sharks, which is different from ours, but um, you want to go in that direction to where that, that sense is increasing because there may be a wounded creature there that you can dine on. Um, well, what sort of, of cephalization and, and you know neurological development and and in the case of humans and monkeys, like the invaginations and the cortex, how do we become calculators of reason? I think your answer, DPR, and Thunderfoot's recent video, I think those things speak to how evolution would um, guide a process which would lead to the development of very good reason calculators. But, but they're asking this question about, well, how does reason itself come to be? And, and That's it, right. it's entwined in that. Uh, you I have, I have a question, general. actually, about this. And this is, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Ozzy, actually. Um, how long have these, as you call them, cyclones been around in this new form? Has it just been a couple of years or something? Well, I've only been aware of them well, for I, a couple I, of I, years. I, I, one, one second, one second, if I may, please. Um, I, I think we were touching upon a very interesting subject, and I think you diverted it uh, to a degree there. Uh, I, I want to, if I can, um, maintain um, the concentration on what we're talking about now. Uh, well, I was going to get. I was going to bring. Yeah, my, my question okay, was going to bring us back. Okay, I apologize. In that case, in that no, case. No, 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 no. It's fine. So, okay. so I'm curious what Ozzy has to say. Oh well, with respect to the the, the cyclones and how long they've been around, uh, I, a couple of years have been on my radar. Um, uh, I mean, I had read a lot about uh, apologetics and, uh, and and was very familiar with evidentialist apologetics. I knew about presuppositionalism because I'd I'd uh, been a teaching assistant for a course on uh, on the philosophy of religion, so I knew about presuppositionalism. But you know, it wasn't a big thing. It was a fa fairly obscure thing that that some philosophical apologists would would be interested in but wouldn't be sort of wouldn't have broad appeal and then suddenly in the course of discussions online I, that I was having on IRC suddenly it seemed that this was coming up a lot and then this name Saiten Brugenkate started popping up uh, and by then I'd sort of extricated myself from uh, from those discussions a little bit um, I was on sabbatical uh, <laughs> from these discussions for a while and um, and then suddenly it just blew up. I mean suddenly Saiten Brugenkate had spawned a whole you know group of disciples who were out there uh, See that's that's what I'm getting to actually is is it does seem to me to be a fairly recent phenomenon. It it goes further back than that. This is what I was getting to. You've got people like Matt Slick who've been doing this for years with with his um, uh, transcendental argument uh, from the existence of logic. Uh, mm -hmm. the, it's mm -hmm. the same argument. How do you how do you account for logic? Right. It, Saiten Brueckengate does it for how do you account for knowledge? It, but the same argument goes for logic. It's the same kind of thing. Yeah, but uh, I'm talking about on, on YouTube, for example, and and yeah, people well, like Kent Hovind and uh, yeah, well, I mean, they, these these are people uh, who've just sort of fallen under the spell of Saiten Brueckengate because it has certain rewards. It, it you you don't have to provide any evidence. You it, it gets you. It, it, it takes you from a position of having to backpedal and backpedal and, and be on the defensive to being on the offensive. And if you if you embrace a kind of reformed um, uh, Calvinistic uh, form of Christianity, which is supposed to be triumphalist uh, in its approach, then this is the apologetic for you, baby. Uh, and that's why they like it. That's why these kinds of people like well, that. Well, see, that I, I, I I sort of noticed. Uh, you know, I've been I've been watching atheist stuff. I, I, again, I haven't made any videos, but I've been watching this for quite a long time, and I've just noticed, as you said, there's this explosion on YouTube, and I'm wondering, um, is it the last refuge of the scoundrel, basically? Because 
you know, before that, we were countering creationists um, like uh, Nephilim Free and before that, uh, the Hovens, etc., who were talking about, you know, evidence for dinosaurs with people, etc. And all that's been debunked over and over again. They have nowhere left to go except in a realm where you cannot account for anything by any means whatsoever. So you can say whatever you want um, and misuse all of philosophy and, and basically arrive to, to the conclusion that you'd like to have. And it just seems to me that the reason why that they are doing this, why they're asking these, frankly, stupid questions. They're not uh, stupid is, questions. I know, not stupid. I know, I know, but I, I'm... I'm well, yeah, they one, just have one, stupid answers. One, one, yeah. one second, if I may, if I may, very quickly, one second. Um, I, I, I agree with you in this regard. Uh, I think that um, the internet destroyed any sort of like evidential or scientific evidence that they uh, tried to uh, present. Um, Ken Hogan being uh, the most obvious mm -hmm. example of that. But um, presuppositionalism, uh, so far as I understand, and I'm going to invite uh, Ozzy to um, tell us about this, uh, it, it goes back not um, in, in years of the internet, but... No, no, I'm, I'm not centuries. arguing that. This, I'm this not is, arguing that. No, I, the, I'm, arguing what, the, what the, I'm arguing the popularity of it now with all of these people. Yeah. I mean, even Hovind now argues as a presuppositionalist Eric does. Before. Eric does. Um, we, we, have, we have no idea what Kent will do when he's right, released. Right, right. That'll yeah. be interesting to see what he does. Uh, but what I'm saying is that yeah, he seems it, to have it shifted It will be to interesting. Yeah, what I'm saying is the popularity well, I don't, I don't know how you, I don't know how you I don't know how you say that because I'm not sure that um, Kent has, has um, made many No, no, I'm talking about Eric. Since I'm talking about Eric. Yeah, no, no, oh, oh, oh certainly yeah. Eric has. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But um, one, one thing that um, uh, I would invite uh, Ozzy to uh, explain to us, if you could, um, although it has become fashionable, um, the presupp presuppositional argument uh, is one that is um, one that comes from hundreds of years ago. Um, it's not that. It's not Tell that old. Its no. origin. Uh, it's not that old. Okay. Well, um, it, it was. It was. Uh, the the argument really uh, originated by, uh, with a philosopher, a, a theologian by the name of Cornelius Van Til. Uh, he's a within the Reformed Calvinistic tradition, and uh, almost all of the people uh, in this uh, tend to come from out of that Protestant that style of Protestant tradition. Um, and uh, he was writing in the 50s, 60s, into the 70s, um, and uh, that that is sort of the, the locus classicus to, to to start looking at this stuff. But the um, uh, but it's it's hard for people who are secularists to read that stuff because it's just it it is written for people who are who belong to that religion, and and so when they write the, their 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 philosophy and they write out these arguments, it's all hooked up with their theology. It's all hooked up with scripture. They they try to proof text everything, support everything uh, with passages from from uh, the scriptures, uh, and so it's really kind of dull and hard to read for us. And of course, if you don't have any understanding of scripture, it's uh, you know and and the religions, it can be kind of you know, head scratchingly difficult to figure out why the heck, how they're connecting the dots. It's not always apparent. There are other, uh, his immediate successor, his sort of protege, was a fellow by the name of Greg Bonson. Uh, he's, he's late. He, he died a few years ago. Uh, but he was a very articulate uh, fellow, and there's, there's a, a debate between him and another apologist within the same uh, religious tradition. Uh, they're both reformed, uh, where one is an evidentialist, R.C. Spruill is an evidentialist, and Greg Bonson is a, is a presuppositionalist, and they go head-to-head -head and debate that, and you can find that, that debate online. It, it's, it's, it's long, but it's interesting, and you, you, you get to hear these two guys arguing which is the better apologetical strategy. And if you, if you listen to that, um, you, you will get a sense of what presuppositionalism is, because you, you get a presuppositionalist arguing with an, an evidentialist why presuppositionalism is the better um, uh, apologetical strategy. Uh, and there are, have been other people who've been writing on the subject, you know, John Frame and Gordon Clark. I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of people. Um, uh, 
but I mean, you, and you don't have to read books on this. You can you can just you know go and, and read a bunch of articles online if you're interested. Um, there's it, it's not always the most fun reading, which I think is why so many atheists I think have badly misunderstood the argument because they they don't want to read this stuff. It's a lot of work, and then you have and it comes to them. They they come to learn about presuppositionalism from Psy and the Cyclones who present a really what I think is a lunk-headed version of it. They get a lot of things wrong. Um, they uh, they 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 present it in an ugly form. I mean, this whole "how do you know" thing. The, the whole point of that is, is, in presuppositionalism is simply to, to illustrate that there's this justificatory regress problem in philosophy. I mean, you, you take a philosophy course, you learn this in five minutes, and then it's done. The point is made. Then you go on. Then you can you know go on and and and, and having having the conversation. You don't have to keep stumping people with it, right? Um, so. I, anybody who doesn't understand presuppositionalism or has a poor understanding of presuppositionalism who's learned it from these guys is to be forgiven if they have a confused understanding of presuppositionalism. They've, they've really it, it made a pickle of it. And they are, th those guys, I, I can tell, they are, they are at pains to properly articulate their own apologetic. Uh, but I think we can up our game. We can sort of you know, learn about this stuff from, from, from either the, the sources uh, themselves um, who've actually written on it or, or, or critics like me who've, who've, who understand some of this stuff and know some of the relevant philosophy and know the epistemology and you can up your game, you can school yourself on this and you can, you can go back and you can tell them what their apologetic is supposed to be. Um, I, there's a lot of people arguing with presuppositionalists who are presenting arguments that are just, you know, your, your ammunition is all firing the wrong way. You know, um, and and when that happens, they walk away thinking their position is unassailable because you haven't actually attacked their position, that, um, and it's it's in part because some of us haven't done our own homework, and they have done a terrible job of articulating their their apologetic. And now you only ever are technically responsible for arguing with the person that you're arguing with, but a good way to sort of, you know, you know, defend yourself against such an argument is to show them where they're actually going wrong and where they're at odds with their own apologetic. That's actually a good thing to do. Um, it helps them and it helps you, and and you can have a more productive dialogue. I've actually had some productive dialogues with with presuppositionalists and myself. It's, it, you know, it, you know, I can actually brag about that. Um, it, but I mean, I okay, haven't talked us, to Saiten Mukherjee. Give us a one hundred and one. Give us a one hundred and one. I was about to ask how to debunk um, presuppositionalism. No, I was about to ask. Okay, well, actually, there's there's no but, easy. Let me give you a quick, uh, just as a guide to that too. I think I think it'd be interesting, even as a video series, the kind of the do's and don'ts, because it is very frustrating. I, I get your point about firing the ammunition in the wrong direction and, and sort of arguing positions they don't hold. Um, for just as a, an example, one of the of the don'ts is um, don't assume that they're trying to tell you, look, as a Christian, I have rationality, but as an atheist, you don't have reason and rationality. Right. right? They, they do accept that people, that's why with the reason rock, I say it actually says this, it emanates this field. Everyone on the planet has reason and rationality to some degree. Um, and, and that's their position. They believe that you are capable of reasoning. It's just that when you do so, you're doing so inconsistent with your own worldview because your worldview doesn't explain reason. So it's, it's things like that. I think, I think there are many sort of do's and don'ts that could be, could be presented um, that would yeah. sort of help focus these discussions. That's yeah, a huge I, one. I, 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 yeah, I, I've heard you speak about this um, before, and I understand. Um, I still, <laughs> I still am at odds um, trying to answer the question as to, you know, why I should care, or, <laughs> again. Well, if you don't care, it doesn't matter. If you don't yeah, care, I, it doesn't matter. Then I, you just get out that, of the conversation. That, that's just. But if you, you know, want to have the conversation, then you have to right. care. Um, but no, because they want to have the conversation that you know that's why God exists. Um, yeah, but you don't but have to have I a conversation. I, right? I, right, I never I, buy I the "I don't care" argument. That you either care or you don't, and if you don't, it's not a problem what they're saying. But if, yeah, if you do I, care, I, I understand you know. that. But but what I'm what I am asking is, um, uh, you know, what has their worldview done lately? Uh, that's that that's what it comes no, down. No, I, I I want if 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 you don't mind. I want to go back to the question which both of us seem to be asking. What are the best arguments against that position? Okay, well, there's a, there's a lot of uh, good arguments. One, one argument is to, to remind them, and this is if you're talking to a cyclone, uh, that their position is that you do have knowledge. Everyone has knowledge according to presuppositionalism. And presuppositionalists insist that they don't leave their worldview. They don't abandon their presuppositions. 
uh, for the sake of argument. The, the, rather, they insist on examining uh, um, uh, your worldview, and they ask that you examine your worldview from within your worldview, and they hope that what you will see and that they will persuade you of is that their lack, there is a lack of conceptual resources in your worldview to explain certain things like morality, logic, knowledge, and stuff like that. Now, with respect to the knowledge argument, uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, that, that they do the cyclones is they get caught up in their own rhetoric and they seem to forget that they're supposed to assume that you too have knowledge, that we all have knowledge. And so, you know, you, you shouldn't sort of uh, let them get away with saying, you don't know anything, so I don't have to listen to you. No, 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 I'm sorry. You're abandoning your worldview there, buddy. Your worldview is, we all have knowledge, right? You think it comes from God. I don't. That's okay. On your worldview, I have knowledge. So any knowledge that I want to point to that you agree is knowledge, you got to listen to, buddy. Otherwise, you've stepped out of your worldview. So that's one thing you can do. Um, another thing you can point out is that they always insist on certainty, and again, this is the cyclones. A proper presuppositionalist is not hung up and obsessed on certainty in this way. They'll say, you know, uh, how do you know this? And, uh, you know, can you be absolutely certain of that? Um, is it, and and people try to then invent some something, some proposition that they, you know they cast about desperately for some proposition that they couldn't be wrong about. Well, that wouldn't matter. Because one of their arguments is precisely that you can't trust your reasoning, and you need to you need to give an example of how you can trust your reasoning. So one thing you can say is, well, first of all, on your worldview, my reason is trustworthy. So on your worldview, um, you have to al allow me that. Uh, but even if you don't want to allow me that, um, you have to make sure that you don't fall into the trap of trying to come up with certitudes that you have that you don't actually have, and don't try to make up an epistemology on the spot. You, if you if you don't know this stuff, just say I don't know. So how do you explain it? And that turns the table right back on them. Now they have to provide an account of knowledge and press them on it. Ask them probing questions. Ask them how they justify things. And you'll find that their account is either pretty thin or stipulative. It just, you know, God just magics knowledge into their heads, which again is not proper presuppositionalism. That's something Seitan Budenkate seems to have invented. Um, this obsession that they have with certainty, they, they all focus on a definition of knowledge. Here's another point. The definition of knowledge that says knowledge is justified true belief. Now that is a respectable definition of knowledge. It's one that goes back to Plato in, in a dialogue called the Theotetus, and it is um, uh, fairly well subscribed. It's the first theory of knowledge or definition of knowledge you'll encounter in philosophy. It is not the only one. I, I don't even know that most philosophers or epistemologists subscribe to that. I don't subscribe to that, the justified or JTB theory uh, of knowledge, the justified true belief theory of knowledge. Uh, but they do. But then they'll insist on certainty, and then you have to remind them, wait a minute, where does certainty fit in here? Justified true belief. What that means is for something to be knowledge, you have to have a belief. The belief has to be true, and you have to have some justification um, for that belief. Well, where does certainty fit in here? Here is an empty glass. Well, if that's true, and I believe that, that, that it's true, and I have a justification, I have justified true belief. Um, now, where does certainty enter into this? This is not part of your definition of knowledge. You're smuggling in an extra condition into your definition of knowledge. Now, they might want to say, well, the idea that of justification is that it has to somehow secure knowledge. It has to secure it absolutely against all possible uh, alternatives like solipsism and stuff like this. Really? Says who? What's your argument for that? Philosophers have tried for a long time to, to, to insist, some philosophers have tried to insist for a long time that, yeah, knowledge implies certainty. Well, okay, that, but that's, you know, this isn't a given. This isn't something we all agree on. I don't know that most, I know that most philosophers don't, don't, don't accept that. I certainly don't accept that when I was doing epistemology. Uh, I rejected that. So there's another objection. What's this fetish you're making of certainty? I realize certainty is a nice thing. It's a desirable thing. It's a necessary condition for knowledge. Says who? What's the argument? I don't buy it. So no, I don't have to satisfy your condition of something that I can't doubt that's indubitable and I couldn't be wrong about. That I don't see how that's a condition on knowledge. The fact that I could be wrong doesn't mean I am wrong. Next. So I mean, there, there's a lot of other things that that, that, that can be said here, but th this is what what happens is they ask you these loaded, difficult questions that most people are ill prepared to answer, and they try to stump you with this. And the questions are loaded in such a way that they trick you into thinking that you have a, a, a burden that you 
really do not have. And then as soon as you try to satisfy that burden and come up with a, 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 an epistemology on the spot or come up with propositions that, that are indubitable and couldn't be wrong, well, now you're backpedaling. You know, you're you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to do that. I mean, I I could stump people with this all day long. A, a first year philosophy undergrad who's taken a course in epistemology can do this. This doesn't take brains, and it and it 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 is it's a kind of a low down dirty trick, and they've elevated it to a, the level of of a kind of moral virtue, and they think that this is a successful apologetic. It doesn't persuade people. Um, and another thing you can remind them is that this is not persuasive. You're not persuading me. What are you trying to do? What is your aim here? Is it evangelism? Who are you evangelizing to? You're not, you're not persuading me. You're not, you're not selling me on, on, on what your worldview is. You're just trying to talk me out of mine. Well, if my worldview were wrong, and DPR's worldview is wrong, and Sally's worldview is wrong, and John's worldview is wrong, if everybody's worldview is wrong, if you could demonstrate that, that wouldn't prove your worldview right. So this impossibility of the contrary that you keep talking about, that your worldview is true by the impossibility of the contrary, your work is cut out for you. You can't just go seriatim through everybody's worldview and prove everybody wrong. That would take too long. You can't do that. You can't know before you've actually encountered all these worldviews that, that, that they're going to be wrong. Even if you did it, some other person could come up with a worldview, a consistent worldview that could answer these questions, and then where would you be? So if you're going to try to prove and establish the, the impossibility of the contrary to your worldview, what you have to do is come up with an argument that shows that all other worldviews than your Christian worldview are necessarily, logically, impossibly incomplete. And, and, and I don't just mean incomplete, I mean incoherent, inconsistent. Um, well, good luck with that. I've been waiting for years for even the, the high-minded, sophisticated uh, presuppositionalists to spell this out properly, and, and I can't find it. It's just not to be found. So this is one of these uh, boasts that they make, that they, can, that they say they can deliver on, but they, they, they almost never get called on it because they get other people backpedaling. If you can sort of get them to say, no, 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 um, uh, I'm going to now explain uh, how I can prove the impossibility of contrary, well, then maybe you could have an interesting argument, but... They, they seldom are able to bring that argument. The, the argument seldom gets to that point. Um, and even if they could prove that all other worldviews were wrong, maybe their worldview is wrong too. They still would have to give you a reason why their worldview is correct. That's a big part of it. I, I've heard said many times that, that, the, that the cyclone version of presuppositionalism is, is an escape from uh, evidentialism, an escape from, from this discussion about the nature of evidence that is supporting the central Christian claims or worse yet, getting into whole creationism nonsense. It, it, it just it, it, it's it's an escape of that. But the thing that they're really escaping is having the spotlight on their own theology, on their own worldview, their own understanding of the functioning and the purpose of the universe. Um, and, and you'll hear them. They have these escape phrases too. If you do ask them, as soon as you start like they're making their point, and then as soon as you start saying, "Well, wait a minute," so you're saying that God has this hell, and then you know He created hell to do it. No, 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 no. We're not here to discuss. That's a theological issue. You know, I would, that's a that's a great topic for a Bible study, and, and you, you get me a group of believers, and I'll have that discussion with them. But right now, we're talking about your worldview. It is absolutely an escape from talking about the um, the inconsistencies in their worldview, including getting into a discussion about the source for it. They're absolutely evasive on. Well, where does your worldview come from? They'll say the Bible, but they're not going to have a discussion with you about how their worldview is in any way grounded in any sort of reasonable interpretation of scripture. Well that was my observation earlier, yeah. yeah. That they, they, they it's the last refuge of the scoundrel basically. Because they, yeah. they have no you know, they've been defeated in, by science and by debate time and time again online and before and now all that's left is basically this pseudo philosophical realm, which they've invented it seems to uh, try to uh, you know have a place to be without being uh, able to be countered. Yeah, yeah. They will always be chasing the gaps. You know, always be chasing the, the gaps in knowledge and understanding, especially of the layman, to uh, to try to find a place to to shoehorn uh, God into, even when they're not trying to explain how God would actually satisfy that, but simply to point out how, oh well, you don't know how life began, you don't know where logic comes from, that sort of thing. It's just a um, just a hungry search for gaps to cram God into. Yeah, that's it is the the last god of the gaps in a sense. 
Uh, I, gentlemen, I, I, I have to get going very shortly. Um, is, go ahead. Well, I, I just I, I may have mentioned on the show before. I know I had mentioned it to to DPR when we were speaking offline one day. Uh, um, but about uh, there was a comment I had seen on YouTube in response to um, we had a show so this a few months ago where somebody had called in saying that they were going to be debating Psy and we were kind of amusing ourselves, uh, you know, pretending. Well, here we'll we'll, we'll play the part of Psy Ted Gate and you can you can give it a shot and and to the hilarity of the audience that. that and, and somebody had made a comment on there, which to me was the funniest comment on YouTube, um, which, which unfortunately I will absolutely suck the comedy out of because it requires explanation. But it was so funny, he referred to Cy as Eliza Ten Brutengate, Eliza Ten Brutengate, with Eliza spelled in all capital letters. And, and I saw that, and I thought, man, that the is a... The computer program. The computer program. So, and again, there are going to be people who aren't going to recognize this. And it's from the 60s, and, and but it, it's a program that was sort of written as a satire of um, uh, the, the Rogerian non-directive psychology. So you would type in there, uh, um, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a um, communication emulator, a language, natural language emulator. So you might go to the keyboard and type in, um, uh, hi, Eliza, how are you today? And then it would respond, I'm fine, how are you? Um, what's on your mind today? And you would say, well, my mother phoned me. And they said, well, tell me more about your mother. And basically this program would just pick keywords out of things you were saying and insert it into a stock set of phrases to make it sort of mimic how people have speech. But there would always be a point when you would interact with this ELISA program that you would just kind of go, well, that was an odd thing to say. That wasn't a very natural thing to say. And it was just like, just like, like you know, hitting a rock in a boat. It was just like this weird, jarring experience. And... Um, I just thought it was such a good observation because that's all that side does in conversation. He just, you know, you say something, you know, well, the universe, or like the, the sun orbits, the, or the or earth orbits the sun. Well, how can you be certain that earth orbits the sun? You know, and, and you say, well, my pizza is delicious. How can you be sure my pizza is delicious? It just pulls these phrases and jams them together. And, and the thing about the ELISA program was towards the end of it, it, it would go through this case statement, it, try to match these things up. And if it wasn't able to do that, it had a set of statements at the end that were things like, um, please go on, or tell me more. They weren't direct reactions to things you were saying. They were just these sort of things it would say when it couldn't think of anything else to say. There are prompts for you to keep talking, so that yeah, you can respond I, appropriately. I yeah. believe, uh, and I'll betray that I have read philosophy, I, I believe that uh, Douglas Hofstadter used it as an example in either Gödel, Escher, Bach, or Meta uh, uh, Magical Themis. I can't remember which, but he, he oh, uses it as... Huh? Yeah, with the good Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, yeah, I, I remember that very well, actually. I read it in the 80s, and uh, yeah. I have it it's on my bookshelf right here. If I turn the camera on, you can see it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's. Uh, it, it, I, I agree. Psi 10 would be exactly like that. Yeah. yeah. As soon as you mention scripture, for example, as soon as you say that, like, oh, uh, uh, well, the, the resurrection accounts are different, and then, and, oh, what, no, you know what, you're going to talk about scripture, that'd be great for a Bible study with believers, but right now we're, you know, so they've got these things. The only thing that would be different is that the ELISA program never ended until you quit. But, yeah. Um, in this case, there would be this sort of one extra line at the end where he just goes, thank you for your time, and then storms out, and, you, and your computer <laughs> would explode. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That that is a perfect analogy to him, actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I've, yeah. I've only seen I've only seen him in action a couple of times on YouTube, but it was enough. You know, you once you've seen it, yeah, how many times you have to observe, um, you know, an idiot trying to make an argument. Uh, I I would I would submit that you only have to see it a few times before you get the entire gist of it, what he's trying to say. Well, one thing I would add to Ozzy's observation, and I mean to hold you for your time to go, but um, no, what you're fine. saying too about you need to to kind of feel out. Um, um, I, I'm re responding to your observation about the I don't care. Well, that doesn't matter to me. Well, then why are you having a conversation? I think sometimes with presuppositionalists, you have to feel them out on why they don't care. One thing that that I find very odd, I really noticed this in in the in the Colin Peterson uh, visit on uh, fundamentally flawed. This is the episode, by the way, where, where when pressed, when he got to his point about, you know, well, you can't know anything for certain, and then other person says, blah, 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 and then you say in response, well, how do you know that blah, blah, blah isn't true, without even thinking about what they said. Alex Botton had said, well, I know that I'm not omniscient, and Colin Peterson said, well, how do you know you're not omniscient? And Alex said, well, because, of our, because I don't know everything. 
And Owen Peterson said, how do you know you don't know everything? <laughs> so, what? Are you even having a conversation? Like, do you know the my, 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 re my response to presuppositions would be, how do you know you're not just a figment of my imagination? Uh, that, yeah, that's been done. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, one. you know. So <laughs> shut up. It's my, it's my, it's my. You know, I mean, it's, it's just, it's like talking. It's like a child. You know, you know, why, 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 why? At, and I, I believe Lawrence Krauss uh, used that as an example. It says at some point the answer is just shut up and go to bed. Uh, yeah. That's, that's what the, the correct answer would be. I, I don't think that's a correct answer. I, 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 I know, but I, yeah. I, I have to, you know. Most of us are not philosophers. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't have to be a philosopher. I, and I don't want anyone to to come away from from what I've said thinking that that oh, Ozzy thinks that you have to be a, a philosopher to, to argue with these people. I I don't. You 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 absolutely don't. No one has a responsibility to do, to devote a chunk of their life to 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 these things. I, I think what we have to do is just be honest about what we know and what we don't know. And if you don't know, if you don't have a good foundation for what you believe or some claim that you take to be true, if you, if you have presuppositions, as I think we all do, and you can't really establish them to be correct, don't make something up and don't let yourself get pressured into thinking that, that you have to embrace false certainty. That, that is a mistake. That is a trap that people fall into all the time. I've seen video after video of people doing exactly that, falling into the trap of, of pretending that they know more than they know. We, we don't have to presuppose anything on insufficient evidence except the things that we in fact do presuppose on insufficient evidence. And when we do, we just have to own up to it and admit it and, and not pretend uh, otherwise. And then you, there's your opportunity to say, yeah, well, you're right. I guess I don't know how to defend induction without arguing in a circle and, and, and using induction to defend induction. Okay, fine. So what's your account? You know, and, and, then, and then, you know, push them on it, right? It, it, what what they hate most, these cyclones, is actually having to present their view. What they want to do is a, an opportunity to preach the gospel. Um, but if you just say, well, no, I'm going to press you on the philosophical questions, and, and it's just a matter of asking them why they believe what they believe. And every time uh, they, 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 they give you they an empty to, answer... They want to preach the gospel without preaching the gospel. Is what no, 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 talking. they want to preach the gospel. They're only too happy to stop talking about that once you, once you, as soon as you actually inquire uh, uh, about, uh, give them an opening to, to talk about the gospel, um, they're, they're usually only too happy to do that. Uh, the, the thing is, you can just say, well, no, no, I'm, I'm not interested in that. What I want to hear is your account. What is your account? What, what, what for you qualifies as an account of knowledge? What are the questions that have to be answered here that, uh, that is... You know, what are the desiderata, what are the necessitata, what are the conditions of satisfaction on an account of knowledge? And now tell me what your account is, and then tell me, explain to me exactly how this satisfies uh, the problems here, and just keep pressing them on this. They, these, their accounts are vacuous, they're empty. Um, I can give examples of that if you like. I really like that approach because it actually parallels something in, in, in contract law known as the, the, the shotgun clause, where you know, if two partners own a business and then one partner wants to get out, so he says, well, I'll give you $80,000 for your, your half of the business. That other party, if there's a shotgun clause, would be able to say, uh, no, I don't want your $80,000, but I'll give you $80,000 for your share of the business. And that person can't turn around and say, well, that's not fair. It, it's worth way more than $80,000, because if they thought it was worth more, then they should have offered more. Um, it, it sort of parallels that sort of, sort of an approach, that if you're asking me, give me an account of this, explain... How can you? How can your worldview explain X? If you ask them, okay, what is required in your estimation? What's required to offer a fair explanation of X? Okay, if that's what you feel is is a fair requirement to provide an explanation, what is your? How is the way that you meet that? Um, the thing that you're asking me of. Well, my my my. Uh, actually, I did have a question for Ozzy. Well, it was more of a yeah. I remember when we first talked about presuppositionalism, you explained to me that, you know, they only have to presuppose two things or three things, I can't remember which it was, but, uh, my, you know, and that, that I would have to presuppose a lot more. My question would be, you know, so what? Uh, why does that make that less valid than somebody who has to only presuppose uh, two things? What if those two things are wrong? So you know, yeah, if I have to presuppose uh, ten things that are right, and you're only supposed presupposing two things that are wrong, 
isn't my worldview better anyway? You know, there's no, there, the entire basis of the argument to me is, is invalid in that, in that regard. I, I'm sympathetic to that objection. You've you got to be careful how you do that, though. Um, when, when the idea is uh, they have this idea that y there's your worldview, there's my worldview, there's all kinds of worldviews out there, and we're trying to figure out whose worldview is, is correct and makes the most sense. And if it turns out that on some worldviews you can't make sense of the concept of knowledge and evidence, if it, if it turns out that the word knowledge in your worldview um, uh, is nothing more than an honorific term that you apply to certain beliefs that you have when you want to praise yourself because you think they're true, okay? Um, or if, if it turns out that the word good and bad and, and, and should and ought, if, if those terms are just sort of exp ways of, uh, fancy ways of saying what you approve and disapprove of and nothing more, if they're just matters of taste, then they're going to say, well, there's something wrong with your worldview because you're not living according to your worldview. You're living according to a, 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 you're, you're, you're living in, in a you're, you're living exactly as if um, certain terms held meaning but they don't actually hold meaning you can't actually use them intelligently you're living in a kind of false consciousness and this should generate a kind of cognitive dissonance in you and so their idea is we have to evaluate worldviews from within internally and then we have to see if if given worldviews have the conceptual resources within them to cash out and explain and make intelligible. Uh, Nathaniel, you're. Uh, oh, am I? Yeah, that's you. Something went off there. Um, uh, so you, you have to make sure that you have the conceptual resources within your worldview to account for these things. And if you don't, you're operating under a kind of false consciousness. This should generate a kind of uh, cognitive dissonance in you. You should see that there's something wrong with your worldview. Uh, deeply wrong with your worldview. You can't live according to the precepts of your own worldview. This is a problem. This, this really would be a problem um, if you find yourself in this situation. It's something that you should think about and maybe reconsider your your, your views. So the idea is they assur are assuring you that their worldview and the presuppositions they make, we all mm -hmm. make presuppositions, but the presuppositions they make, they insist, can cash out all of these concepts and you can't. So really what you don't realize is that you are borrowing from their capital. You are, are really um, borrowing from their worldview and just not admitting it, that you are, you are living exactly as if there was a god operational behind the scenes doing all this work, lending meaning and significance. And Say that. I, don't, I don't buy that at all. Well, I you mean, don't have I'm to not. buy it. You, you yeah. you no, don't, listen, listen, I'm not trying to sell it, so you don't have to buy yeah, no, no, it. No, no, no. I'm trying no, to get no, you to understand I, it. I understand. I understand. <laughs> what I'm saying is I don't, I don't, when somebody gives me that argument, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say, yeah, you know, uh, you're right, uh, I am barred. No, 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 that's, that's not the argument. Issue, yeah. That's what's at issue here. That, their, their, their argument isn't, you need to uh, believe my worldview. The, the argument is, I'm going to show you the holes, the incompleteness, the incoherence of your own worldview, and then I'm going to show you the coherence and internal consistency and completeness of my worldview, and then I'm going to leave it to you what you want to do about that. Okay, uh, because whether you realize it or not, you're borrowing that's, from my that's worldview. A, that's yeah. assuming that I have holes. That's my point. I don't that have what? holes. I, that's assuming that well, I no, do no, have no, holes. No, 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 it's not assuming. They, 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 they actually make an argument to show that there are, are problems in your worldview. One of them is, how do you know, how do you know, how do you know, and they point out the, the, this infinite logical regress, right? Uh, it's very easy. I, I could, I could, most people could stump most other people on the question of morality, right? What makes something good? And then they trot out some reasons. Well, it makes those things good. Why is that a good making property? And you just keep going, and you can generate uh, an infinite regress of, of I, I moral can, I justifications. I can see they don't, they don't talk to many Jews. You have to you have to talk to a Jew to get an answer like this, because it's a I, complicated thing. I married one, thing. so, it's a, it's I, a married one, so I have a sense. I have a so, sense of, uh, of how it works. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've talked. I've talked to plenty of ultra orthodox in my time, and, and they will have they will have answers, and they are very complicated and lengthy answers. Uh, but you have to listen to them. You can't. You can't just say, "Well, how do you know? How do you know?" They will give you the answer, but you just have to shut up and listen for a while. And and so um, yeah. Well, that, that that is something that that is something that that that, that Sai and, and and his ilk will not do is just shut up and listen. Well, I, exactly. Uh, but, but a proper pre, a proper presuppositionalist will and yeah. will try to to find the holes in any worldview. Now, th th what's important to understand here is that supposing that someone really did established that there were real problems in your worldview, like real incoherences, right? Such that, oh wow, I really am not living according to what I say I believe. Yeah. Holy smokes, okay? That's a reason to, to, to abandon or at least revise what you believe. 
And if then they can show, if they could show, that their worldview was free of these problems, that would be a reason to reconsider your okay, worldview and consider these theirs, such, right? These are such generalities. Give me an example. Give me a specific example as to, you know... Sure, sure, sure. Um, okay, uh, I'll, I'll give you the knowledge one, the one, the one that, that the, the cyclones almost never get around to articulating, but, but is very clear in one of the better cases within presuppositionalism, the theory of knowledge, okay? Um, they, they want to um, uh, account for knowledge. Now, what, they say, well, we can get out of the justificatory regress, and they get out of the justificatory regress by abandoning what's called an internalist conception of justification. When a person says, how do you know, how do you know, how do you know, okay, and they're asking you to give reasons, the, the reason you get into a regress is because you, everyone is assuming falsely, this is something that philosophers have sort of figured out a long time ago, this isn't presuppositionalists that discovered this, they're just borrowing this idea, that if if justification, epistemological justification consists of giving reasons and having reasons, then you're then you're really going to have a problem because if what what if what justifies my belief is my ability to give reasons, well, wait a minute, I, I'm going to end up in that regress. If if it turns out that having to give reasons is is something that ha that that has to be psychologically a current a thought in my mind, right, or at least summonable to consciousness at some point, if that's what constitutes justification, holy crap, I've got a problem because in order to know that this is you know, uh, an empty glass of beer, I have to have a mental experience, okay? And I have to be able to say, in principle, what that justification is. Oh, well, I saw it. And then I have to justify how my, my reliance upon vision. And then I have to, you know, justify my, my, my trust in evolutionary biology and, 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 and how my visual uh, system uh, evolved and stuff like that. And on and on and on, right? As long as I have to keep providing reasons, if, if the reasons have to be conscious or at least summonable or available to consciousness, then I'm stuck. If that's what justification is, there's a justificatory regress. But so that's a specific example. No, 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 no. That, that's a specific problem, okay? Okay. Now, right. now the example is this. Now, now the, the other problem, the, the way out of the problem is to say, no, no, no. Justification of a belief is an external thing. It's not a subjective thing. It's not a psychological condition that you have to satisfy of giving reasons or knowing reasons or having certain thoughts in your head. That leads to an infinite regress. No. To have a justified true belief is simply to have a belief that is true, and there has to be some causal story that is true that causes you to have the belief. If I look at a beer glass and photons bounce off the glass and 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 you know go through my cornea and 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 and, and enervate my uh, my retina and this sets off a chain reaction through my uh, my optic nerve in, into my visual cortex and it cascades out into the, the rest of uh, my higher cortical regions and stuff like that and this results in a visual experience of a beer glass then my belief and that visual experience of the beer gla glass is caused by the beer glass mm -hmm. it is not, there is an objective state of affairs that connects my mental state to that. Now, I don't have to know any of that. I might not wait, know wait, wait, My wait, dog okay, doesn't know. Wait, wait, wait. What's the question they're asking you specifically? How do you know this is a beer the, glass? How do you know this well, is a beer my, glass? My, my, my Jewish answer would be, how do you know it's not a beer glass? You know, that's a stupid answer. No, that's a completely fa no, not, not to offend Jews, but that is yeah, a fatuous no. answer. You don't it, it, answer it, a question as much with of a, a question. Fatuous answer as it you is do a fatuous not answer a question. question with a question. You answer a question no, trying to get the answer. No, that's that's in Jewish tradition. You answer every question with another question. That's the well, okay, but that's just to not answer a question. I mean, I mean, literally, you're not answering the question. You by I, definition I are not that. answering I understand the question. That. Right? But, that's just or not, you could say, or what you could say is just. Now, look, this is you don't want to you don't want to be reduced to playing games with them. They're playing a game with you. Okay, don't don't stoop to playing a game with them. And and that's what you you want to do. And I understand that no, there is a tradition um, uh, uh, within Jew, Jew, Jewish religious discourse where you try to illustrate a point by asking by by returning with re rhetorical questions. I mean, I, I don't mean to disparage that, mm -hmm. uh, but the point is that. That's not the tradition you're operating within, and what they're trying to do is actually get you to answer the question. And here's what, um, what, what their answer to the question is. So I gave you the answer that I would give to how I know that this is a beer glass. Okay? There's an external justific justificatory circumstance that's going on here. 
I don't have to know any of this when I see a beer glass, all of this machinery that I just described. Okay? Mm -hmm. it, my dog could look at, at, at something and see it there, and that's what's operative. Okay? The justification is an external thing. It's not subjective. Okay? It results in a subjective mental experience of seeing a beer glass, but the justification is not a reason that I give. The justification is a metaphysical, physical, external, real state of affairs that mm -hmm. occasions or causes my, my belief. My beliefs are caused. Now, if that's the case, then I, th I, my belief is justified. Now, they might say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. How do you know that the, any of that story is true? Oh, well, now yeah, you're not you don't know me. the justification. Yeah. Right. Now you're asking me. Now, now, two things are going on there. First of all, I answered your question how I know there's a beer glass. Now you're asking me how I know some other set of facts is true. That's a different question. I can answer that question there, buddy. There's a whole other story to be told about that. But wa watch out now. Because what I'm doing is I'm insisting on an ex I'm going to insist on an externalist conception of justification. If you're going to say no, no, but you've got to give me the reasons, I'm going to say wait a minute. Why are you insisting on an internalist conception of justification? Who says that's how justification justification has to go? I know that for pragmatic purposes of persuading other people, I have to be able to give you reasons. I know that for to satisfy conditions of public assertability, I have to give reasons. But that's not how I know what. My giving reasons isn't how I know things. My having external causes is how I know things. Okay. That's how I know things. Mm -hmm. If you want to insist on an internalist conception of justification, you better give me a reason why that is the definition of justification and why you're only going to settle for that. And let me remind you, Mr. And here's the, the, the I'm going to close the loop finally, okay, uh, Nathaniel. I'm going to remind the, the presuppositionalist that on your epistemology, you're an externalist. Your view is this. How, do, how does, uh, does Saitan Brugenkate or any of these presuppositions know that this is a beer glass? There is a God. He created a universe. He's a good God. He's a rational God. And he created a good and rational universe. He created a, a universe with law-like regularities that hold across time. He created us for this world. And he created the, the world for us. And we are built. We are engineered, manufactured creatures built so that um, our senses and our perceptual abilities and our uh, inferential practices and our memories and all of this are generally reliable. They co-vary systematically with changing affairs in the world around us. And now if that story is true, if that story is true, it's not a stupid story, if that story is true, then I can trust my senses. And I know what I think I know when I look at a beer glass. So here's what it comes down to with the presuppositionalist on, on the question of knowledge. He is saying, if my big metaphysical picture is true, then I know what I think I know. And what I'm saying is the same thing. If my metaphysical picture is true, then I know what I think I know. Mm -hmm. Now, whose metaphysical picture is right? Oh, I think it's going to come down to something like evidence. Yeah. Right? Um, we're going to have a problem here. Now we have to compare worldviews. We have to compare whose metaphysical picture is true. So it's not just enough to say who's got an account. I do have an account. I studied uh, epistemology. I have an account of, I have a definition of knowledge. I have an account of justification. I have a theory of truth. I have all of these things. There are other epistemologists who have these things. You don't have to walk around knowing these things to know things, right? There, as long as there are conditions that justify your beliefs, then you know what you think you know. For the, for the, for the purposes of public assertability and persuading other people, then of course you want to be able to say what those justifying conditions are, right? That's why we want to be able to give reasons. And that's what gives rise to the intuition that it's so important to always be able to give reasons. But the, the giving of the reasons isn't what justifies your beliefs at all. Right? And that's why, incidentally, I, I reject the justified true belief theory of knowledge. I, I, I subscribe to something called, uh, no, well, the definition of knowledge I would go with is something called reliably produced true belief. I don't think justification is part of the definition of knowledge. Justification has a pragmatic value. We don't want to get rid of justification, but it's not an ingredient in knowledge. As long as your beliefs are reliably produced, um, then that's fine, that's good enough, that's knowledge, and that means you don't have to be certain either. So, I mean, that, that, that would be sort of my way out of the, the, uh, th this problem, but this is what happens. The way they answer these, the, these big questions is they say, well, there is this God you see, and he created the world, and he created us for it, and he created us such that we can trust our senses, and, and, and on and on and on. If that story is true, then they know what they think they know. 
Um, but I have an alternate metaphysical picture, and on my metaphysical picture, I know what I think I know. So whose metaphysical picture is right? Right. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I, it, it's you. You can't just say, "Oh, my belief, my my worldview is consistent and can a, can account for things." Therefore, my worldview is right. Look, if my worldview is right, great. If my worldview is wrong, well, that's unfortunate. But I can't go around boasting that because I have an account of this that my metaphysical picture of reality is true. That's precisely what I cannot do, and that's precisely what they cannot do. And it's precisely why it's bullshit when they try to pass off a person's incidental ignorance on philosophical questions that their worldview is true by default. And, 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 and I think their account of knowledge is the best account they've got to give. And when it comes to morality and logic, it's just terrible. I mean, if, 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 the, if the account of knowledge that I, that I presented seems thin, uh, for them, uh, wait till you hear what they, what they have to say about logic and and, and morality. It's it, it's much worse. So th that's how they 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 proceed. That's sort of the logic. They're insisting on an externalist conception of justification, but when they ask you to justify your beliefs, suddenly the rules change. There's a double standard. You have to play by the rules of internalism. You have to yeah. keep giving reasons. They don't have to keep giving reasons. On their view, there just have to be reasons that yeah. justify their knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's playing by two different standards of evidence. One for you, I, one for them, no good. I, see, I, I think, think one this problem adds to a, a very lengthy catalog of, uh, of uh, definitional equivocations that they engage in uh, as, you're, as you're explaining that. And that, that, that's interesting, and it was new to me. Um, yeah, to uh, me too. I think that the, the uh, use of the word justify, um, justification, I, I can see it, it, it's, it's subtle. And I think I have to kind of go away and ponder this a little bit more. but. But um, we, we often use the word justify to mean provide to another person, uh, I will use the word justify, um, um, make, make this seem reasonable to another person. Yeah, right? it's sometimes uh, called warrant, to warrant a belief. Yeah, no. Um, that, that's not what you mean? It, it might be. I, now, now I'm mixing up which sense I'm using it. Um, okay, if I'm pulled over by a police officer doing... Um, I'm going to say 140 kilometers an hour. Are we still got the Canadian? Oh no, we're the minority this time. Uh, going too fast. And and the police officer says, "Well, why were you driving that fast? Uh, I need to. Yeah, I believe that is give warrant in that context. Um, I need to provide an explanation to another person that would that would sort of warrant that that activity. Um, but that's not the cause of the activity, right?" And it's just, so. So when I come to the belief in uh, in the empty beer glass, there's an empty beer glass that you you're holding up, and apparently your wife's not getting the message. You've mentioned it about seven times, and she still hasn't brought you another beer. Um, <laughs> well, she's not at my she's not my beck and call girl, you know. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you know what? Uh, you know what? I'm gonna get more more uh, more anti-feminist uh, hate mail this week. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I also have another hangout I got to do in about an hour, so I got to make sure I'm not loaded. So. I, <laughs> I have to get to bed. It's it's like uh, 3 a.m. here almost, but yeah. uh, we have to. Well, before people peel away, we have to do a head count. I know what happened last week. That the uh, well, I, I I'm wondering where again DPR hasn't spoken in about an hour. So uh, well, well, it occurs to me, and sometimes this happens with the hangouts. I know they do it on on uh, fundamentally flawed sometimes, where they just say, well, even if the host goes to bed or whatever, the show can run. This is one of the problems with these shows. I mean, it's it's about supper time for me, but but uh, you know, it's Monday morning for. DPR, so I, I totally understand if the host wants to go away. I just, I wish we knew it was happening when it was happening. Anyway, the justify thing, I, I, I have to think about that a little bit more, but I think there's a difference between saying what is the sort of cause of something which creates the circumstances versus, versus um, that's in contrast with how, what words you would choose to explain to another person. Right? Yeah, I can I, have a justified belief in your empty beer glass um, that's justified by the circumstances. But then, how would I carry that forward in words to provide an explanation, my reasons for why I believe it, uh, to another person? It's a very different thing, and I it's yeah, just uh, in that language. Yeah, well, you have to be careful. I mean, what the the account of justification that I've just given is controversial. Not all philosophers would agree with it by any stretch. Uh, I'm I'm what, what they call an externalist. The reason I think it's it's good to use externalism is because. Um, uh, people who are presuppositionalists, those who know anything about about philosophy, are externalists. Now, 
I don't I don't think Sai understands these things enough to, to know that he's supposed to be an externalist and so he slips into internalism all the time when he gives his own account because people ask him how he knows things and he slips into saying things like well my God reveals it to me in such a way that I can be certain. <laughs> he, he doesn't realize he doesn't have to make that move, that he doesn't have to sort of slip into internalism. Um, but uh, tend to be or understand or know the difference between internalism or externalism. You know, don't go parroting anything I've said here um, unless you know what you're talking about or, or thought about it uh, and done a bit of reading on it because someone's going to trip you up. Uh, but my my point is these are the kinds of things that are wrong. When you, when when people take on a philosophical uh, apologetic, you shouldn't assume that you're going to be able to sort of see through it like a laser, right? You you might not. In the same way that if someone, you know, comes along like um, like Hovind and 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 sells you a pile of of of, of, of bullshit science that if you don't know any science that you're going to be able to see through the fallacies, right? Uh, you, you just you can't pretend. Uh, but this uh, one thing about this apologetic though is you can turn the tables on them by just being honest and saying I don't know the answers to these questions. Um, so what are your answers and just keep pressing them on it. Um, yeah, and that's what I was going to say. I wonder if I can drag us back a little bit to the, to the moral discussion. I think this is an important uh, and common uh, misstep. Um, in one of the discussions on, on uh, fundamentally flawed, and, and I, I will say that I respect them though that, that I, I think they made a misstep here, was in, in trying to give an account of morality um, when asked repeatedly, like, well, you know, what 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 makes this right or wrong? Like, what you know, how can you say that that's wrong? You know, well, what if I'm a murderer and I just you know killed 70 people? Like, well, what makes that wrong? And they would would start to say, well, that's because you know it harm it breaks the law. Oh, so breaking the law that that's what defines right and wrong. So so that means then that uh, Germans that killed Jews in, in concentration camps in World War II, then you know that that's not immoral. That's perfectly fine because that's what the law was. Well, no, 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 it's not that. And they would kind of like kind of allow themselves to get uh, pinball batted around, um, trying to chase down their foundations for morality. With the, the 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 Christians kind of acting like they held the the moral high ground because they do have an account of morality. Let's set aside for the moment that it's a totally twisted subjective morality of a fictional character and does not lead to actual good moral conduct either in theory or in practice. But yeah, they would they would start saying, well, they, they would strain it, try to connect. They say, well, well, what makes um, killing people wrong? Well, you know, if there was a tribe of people that you know they were killing, well, then you know they killing each other. Well, then they wouldn't have survived to propagate. Well, now they're moving towards giving an anthropological or evolutionary account of how they think morals had developed, but that still doesn't speak to what makes something you know right or wrong or whatever else. But but they would allow themselves to be chased around trying to give an account of morality instead of just saying. Um, as, as I think I would in these circumstances, having seen these discussions, when somebody asks me what makes something right or wrong, I would say, well, in trying to answer a question about morality or right or wrong, I try to think about, uh, for example, the way Sam Harris put it, and in, in if you imagine the absolute zero of, of uh, the human condition, that is the, the greatest conceivable human suffering, anything that takes us further away from the greatest conceivable human suffering would be a good thing, anything that moves us closer to that greatest conceivable human suffering would be a bad thing. And they would say, well, what makes human suffering wrong? I would have to go, well, I don't know. I, I don't know that I could put in no, the words. No, Sam Harris's answer is better. He says, I, 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 I don't think I know, and I'm certain that you don't know. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. That's, exactly. Yeah. That's where I would go with it. Yeah. You say, well, you know what, I mean, because you can keep doing that. Well, what makes this wrong? Well, what makes that wrong? Well, well what makes avoiding human suffering a laudable goal? And, and I've heard, heard Sai ask straight out, well, so what if every human being on the planet died? So what? What's wrong with that? Okay, well, you know what? I, I don't even know how to answer that question. I'm just saying, we, with morality, with logic, with rationality, at some point you have to do some bootstrapping. And I'm willing to insert as, as, a, as a basal, sort of my platform here, I'm willing to bootstrap by saying, let's try to not make people suffer. I'm willing to extend that into, let's try to limit animal suffering as, as, as much as we can. And then you get into the thorny details that emerge from adopting that as a basal assumption. But as to why that's a good starting point, I don't know that I can provide a justification to it. So what? 
And I, I think the the, yeah. the other the, I don't know, and uh, I don't have to. <laughs> is the other thing. Uh, it's just it's just part of human nature. Uh, it's it's self evident. I think. No, it's um, I, you've got to be careful with self evident. Think all kinds of things are self evident that aren't true, <laughs> right? And and that this is one of the things that happens. A lot of people want to sort of uh, pin a lot of stuff on 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 self evident. This is a self evident truth and stuff like that. Well. I actually don't know of any self-evident truths. There are lots of things. There are lots of things that are absolutely true that I would never be able to deny. I could not. I could not muster a sincere doubt about them. You know, like that I'm thinking or that I exist or you know things like mm -hmm. that. I I can't en entertain a sincere doubt. But that doesn't mean that that because I'm incapable of doubting something, that that it, it, I'm incapable of error on that subject. That you know, th th there's a real problem here. There's you know, Descartes had this sort of cogito, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am argument. His criterion for truth there was that something is absolutely true if it's not subject to doubt. I mean, he could have said not subject to revision, not subject to error, not, you know, or incorrigible, not subject to, to, to correction. There's any number of things he could have said, but he said not subject to doubt. And like, doubt is a psychological state, and you never want to hinge anything on the fact that you feel certain about it. That is exactly what the cyclones and what most religious people do. They feel this this conviction and it's it's got the status of bedrock in their in their belief system they think. And uh, consequently they, they they think you can't give this up and uh, this is not a habit that we want to get in, into as I think as a uh, as uh, people devoted to, you know, rationality and and skepticism is is trying to anchor our our epistemology, our moral philosophy, our, our, our entire rational outlook on things that we can't doubt. Uh, you know, the, the, this isn't the way to go. You always want to try to be able to give reasons where you can give reasons and where you can't give reasons. You just have to honestly say, I don't know. This is just, it seems to me this is a principle of intellectual honesty and intellectual modesty to concede where you don't know and not pretend. We just get into so much trouble with these people when we pretend to be sort of living in the kingdom of reason and having all these answers in our back pocket or, uh, and, or, or sort of implying that the answers are just around the corner, you know, the scientists and the, you know, are just about to, 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 to give us the answers to these questions. This, this isn't true. We don't, we don't know that to be the case. Um, and we, we, we discredit and disqualify ourselves as credible uh, representatives of, of skepticism and rationality when we overstate these sorts of things. We start to sound like religionists and faith heads. And I think we have to sort of push that, that temptation away from us with, with both hands. Um, so uh, I, I don't, stay I don't away from self-evidence. I'm sorry. That's such a bad thing. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's always such a bad thing because, as you pointed out, they're talking to audiences who sort of are looking for this sort of certitude and they see it coming from these guys whereas when they when you know atheists etc speak about these things there's this kind of from a lot of atheists there's this kind of well I'm uncertain etc I, maybe we should show more certainty. Maybe we should point to the history of science and say, you know what? No, we, but you, you know, can't. People, not false certainty. Not false certainty. No, no, not false that. certainty. But you could say you could say a respectable, uh, a respectable amount of belief in, uh, you know, the history of science leads me to believe that uh, the, the trend shows that uh, you know we will solve certain questions uh, as we no, have no. solved. No, no, that's okay. That's okay. And and I I'm one of these people who thinks that the domain of science is not is not sort of circumscribed so that we know that these are the scientific questions and these other questions, those are philosophical questions. Science can't answer those. I don't believe uh, right. in that's these sort I, of magisteria. Yeah, yeah, okay. I agree. I agree. Yeah, so I mean I think that moral questions are amenable to scientific answers in principle. I, it remains to be seen whether that we will be able to have well, I think, satisfying. I think Sam Harris made an excellent uh, excellent point in his book. I mean I'm glad Hawkeye yeah. brought it up. I, I, I read the book and uh, I, I thought it was uh, an excellent case. I mean, uh, granted, he uses the most obvious moral uh, uh, examples or immoral examples, and he, he admits to that in several talks. He said, you know, let's at least start there and work from there um, because you do have people who are saying, well, how do you know that's wrong, etc. 
Uh, and so, yeah, start with the most obvious. But I think he does make a, an excellent point that uh, science can answer uh, most of these questions in, in a lot of cases. And, uh, and, and we are learning more and more about uh, the answers to these questions. So, uh, yeah, that would be my... I wouldn't answer. say it answers most of these questions. No, no, I, I would say it answers most of these more. questions. I think no, it gives a sort of... It, it, it can. I mean, yeah, in the future. Yeah, that's right. In the future, yeah. right. I, I, as I study, uh, you know, the yeah. last 10 years uh, in, in neuroscience has been incredible, the amount of things that we've learned with MRI and, and other techniques and uh, things that we never yeah. thought we would a ever answer before. I mean, the fact that I forgot the name of the drug, but you can actually... Um, inject somebody with this drug and, and, and they will actually feel love for things. Um, oh, that's a, oxytocin. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, you know, uh, these things these things that, frankly, people thought that would never be answered by science, and we're, we're, we're showing a lot of these so far are, you know, chemically based and, and whatnot, and uh, yeah, there, there are a lot of questions that have been answered in the last 10 years that have to be, you know, more researched more, but they, they are definitely out there at this point and, and more to come, it seems. So I, I would point to that and say, look, I'm fairly certain that science will answer, you know, most of these questions in the near future or in, in the, you know, just beyond our lifetime, et cetera. But the evidence is clear, the trend is clear that this is this is being worked on by science and not just by people sitting around thinking about it, uh, so that that would be. Can I just ask you though, um, how like science could answer like a typical sort of like moral dilemma, like um, the one where you're a doctor and you're in a hospital and you could kill this one man, and if you do that, you'll save this one woman. Yes, yeah, Sam, um, Sam Harris. I just don't Sam, think. That, I just don't think that you. Well, I mean, maybe I haven't read Sam Harris's point. Maybe I should. Yeah, he, I mean, he actually addresses that one, but it's. Yeah, it's gentlemen, uh, I, I have to go. Yeah. I'm sorry. And to, me to, too. It's it's three uh, a.m. I really yeah. have to get to bed. Margaret, yeah. I, I I'm sorry. That's, That's an excellent right. point. I and I have some thoughts on on the matter, but I I I've got to be somewhere, and uh, so I, I've got to I got to get going. But anyway, thank you, gentlemen, yeah, for the, the, the discussion. It was a pleasure once again to talk to you guys. Really. Yeah, uh, likewise, it's always fun to talk on this show. Yeah, and, and please don't Definitely. please don't take my antagonizing attitude as a as a marker that I really don't no. respect philosophy. <laughs> I do actually. No, it's okay. I said, I, 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 I've read I've read <laughs> Douglas Hofstad or when I was like I was like twelve. Somebody gave me the book and I've loved it ever since. So I did. So you, uh, you can't pursue an academic career in philosophy as I I, I once did and and. And and not develop a thick skin for for sort of uh, you know uh, uh, disrespect for philosophy and philosophers. It's quite all right. I, I, I don't mind say, it at I all. Should, well, I should <laughs> say I have I have a, res a healthy respect for real philosophers and not for pretend ones. So oh, well, that's, that makes me feel a little better. <laughs> there is a there is a uh, yeah there there you go. I, anyway, have a good night, everybody, and thank you very much. Uh, likewise, good night, folks. Bye. See you guys. Everybody left? Anybody still watching? <sighs>